Jesus is just getting started. I feel a particular kinship to Jesus in this story that Jim just read of trying to launch a new ministry. Jesus is beginning to assemble his staff. Maybe he too needed someone to get him organized. <laughs> what strikes me about how Jesus seems to be going about this is it feels sort of relaxed and casual. Maybe some would think too casual. There's no formal interview process. <coughs> he doesn't ask anyone for a resume, no papers to sign, no structured skills assessment or even inquiry into their background, no questions about earned degrees and education and all of that, no calling upon previous employers for references. Very relaxed. A process that would make most human resource people quite uncomfortable. I got thinking about interviews for jobs that I've been through in my life. Some very pleasant, some not so pleasant. My first full-time job after graduating from seminary and getting through hospital chaplaincy training was, at a chap was as a chaplain at a hospital in Florence, Kentucky. The director of pastoral care for this health system was someone I had known for, from my first unit of chaplaincy training. He was a friend, and, and he was a very relaxed sort of person, so the interview was more like a casual conversation. Have you been through an inter interview like that? I felt very good about it and pretty confident that I had a good chance of being hired, and after he and I talked for a little while, he had set it up for me to spend some time with the CEO of the hospital. Now, I don't think I had ever met a hospital CEO before, and I was a little nervous, so I stopped by the restroom before meeting him. <laughs> Turns out that the CEO was a very nice man, and, and we chatted for about 15 minutes, and I left his office feeling very good about everything. And I went back to meet up with the director of pastoral care, and, and we're standing in the office along with this elderly woman who was a volunteer secretary. And I said, well, that went very well. He, he the CEO, he was, he was a very nice man. And Maurice, the director of pastoral care, motioned me to come on into a back office. And he said, in a way that you could tell, he was trying very hard not to embarrass me. He said, <clears throat> Um, your pants are unzipped. <laughs> I had gone through the entire interview with the CEO with unzipped. <laughs> Amazingly, I got the job. <laughs> the best interviews I've had have been those in which it seemed like they were as much if not more interested in getting to know me as a person as they were trying to figure out if I had what it took to do the job or if I knew all the right answers to the questions. I think the worst interview I ever had, and I apologize to any Baptists among us, but it was with a Baptist church pulpit committee. The chairperson of the committee was a woman who I swear, Dana Carvey, you remember him? He had to have modeled his character on Saturday Night Live, called the church lady after this woman. She was definitely in control of the committee, because all of the rest of them just seemed to defer to her. Well, about five minutes into the interview, just after introductions and such, she said, this was all in one question. She said, well, can you tell us your position on the King James Bible, abortion and homosexuality? Well, it was all I could do to keep from responding. Well, isn't that special? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember what answer I gave, but I knew from the look on her face that my answer did not satisfy her, and for all intents and purposes, this interview was over. Uh, I did not get that job. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Four months after that interview, I received my first appointment in a United Methodist Church, and my introduction to the Staff Parish Relations Committee was so pleasant, they just wanted to get to know me. 
and me them, and I did not feel as if these folks were trying to back me into a corner or pin me down on anything. They were going to take me as I am. Well, they really didn't have a choice, but they were going to take me and let me love them and serve alongside them, and they in turn loved me and mine in return. Jesus is gathering folks to work alongside him, and the way he's going about it feels a lot like that. Andrew came first. Andrew had heard what John had to say about Jesus and decided there was something very special here, and he wanted to be a part of it, and he went and he told his brother Simon, later to be called Peter, and they started following Jesus, and Jesus asked them, hey fellas, what are you looking for? And they said, well, we just wanted to know where you are staying. And Jesus answered, well, come on and see. All very casual, very personal, very relationship-centered, no high pressure. And it goes on like that, the scripture says. The next day, Jesus wanted to go into Galilee. And he found the guy by the name of Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And Philip, who was from Bethsaida, which was the same hometown as Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, Well, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, Jesus. It's Jesus, you know, Jesus, Joseph's son from over there in Nazareth. And Nathanael said, Well, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip said, Well, come and see. Again, I'm so struck by how free-flowing and relaxed and relational and personal this whole process feels. This is how Jesus gets started. He spots Nathaniel and he basically says, I know you, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel's taken aback at first. How do you know me? And, and, and Jesus says, before Philip called you, I saw you over there under the tree. There's something so inviting and non-threatening and uplifting about the way Jesus builds his team and gathers his flock. So very different from what we're used to in the world. How do we get a team together? Do you remember back in junior high school how teams got picked? If it was in physical education and had anything to do with athletic competition, that was always a very painful process for me. You know, you divide into two teams and someone's appointed a captain of each one and each captain got to pick somebody back and forth, right? And one by one, people were picked and it always came down to just two people left, Oakley Pennington and me. <laughs> now Oakley, bless his heart, was a late bloomer and in the seventh grade he weighed about 50 pounds and he stood about four foot six inches tall. So I understood their hesitancy about Oakley. Well, I was just uncoordinated and bad at anything involving the throwing, catching, batting, bouncing, pitching, or whatever of a ball. And I still am. Now when it came to spelling bees and math races, I had them begging me to join their team. There's something incredibly powerful about feeling as if you are known. In a culture where anonymity is rampant, it is nice every once in a while to feel as if you are known. In a time when so much of our interactions are with a computerized voice, press one, press two, press six, that is not a valid response, goodbye. <laughs> In such a world, there's a hunger for personal contact. In an era where even church can become just another place where you're a face in the crowd, there's something meaningful about being noticed and known and wanted on a team. Jesus says, Thank Nathaniel, I noticed you over under the tree, and I thought, now that's a guy I want on my team. Come follow me. So Nathaniel joined because somebody knew his name. He came along because his friend Philip had invited him there. And Philip had come because he was from the same hometown as Andrew and Peter, who had already met Jesus. And Jesus saw Philip. And then Simon Peter came because, you see, his brother Andrew said, there's this guy who I've 
who I've come across, and I think he's the real thing, and I want you to meet him. And Andrew came to Jesus because he'd overheard something Jesus' cousin, John, had had to say about Jesus. Do you see the pattern? Do you see how the team is building? Do you see how the community is expanding? Do you see how the ministry is growing? It's one-on-one, -on -one, person to person. It starts small, and even as it grows, it's always very personal. Well, I know you. Well, well, let me tell you about somebody else I know. Yeah, he knows him, and she knows him. That, that, that's the faith, my friends. That is Christianity. It's about connections. It's about being known. Throughout history, Christianity has been at its best. The kingdom work has thrived when this is how it's been practiced. Person to person, one by one. And throughout Christianity, throughout history, Christianity has gotten distorted whenever we forget but this is a faith about God and people. This is a faith that understands the God of the universe is interested in people, interested in you and in me, and in all the rest of his billions upon billions of children around the world. I agree with the commentator who says it's always person to person. If you follow the story through the New Testament, you remember an Ethiopian eunuch who was a foreigner. He, he was sitting up in his chariot, puzzled by a passage in the Old Testament, and Philip comes along, and he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus, it says in Acts. And you remember when Peter went to the household of the Roman soldier, the Roman centurion, Cornelius, and told all the people there about Jesus. And the scripture says, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all of who had heard the words. And that very encounter at that one house with that one family was the breakthrough of the Christian faith to the Gentile world. Started small, very personal. The spread of the Christian church across the world is the person-to-person -person story of the thousands of people who fanned out across the globe to tell the story about Jesus and what Jesus had done for them. People become Christians because, you see, they have seen what the Christian faith has done for those whom they know. Or they sometimes don't become Christians because they look at what people who say they're Christians say the Christian faith has done for them. Hmm. The saying passed down from the early years of the church still rings true. Well, see those Christians? How they love one another. Do they say that about us today? Hmm. Our task as Christians is not to prove the truth of the Christian faith. Our task is not even to persuade others to become Christian. Our task is to say, come on and see. Come and see for yourself. Philip could have given Nathaniel some of his own opinions. He could have said, Nathaniel, this Jesus knows a lot about the Bible. Or he might have said, there's something about this man Jesus that draws me to him. Even when Nathaniel expressed skepticism about anything good coming out of Nazareth, Philip might have listed some very successful people who have come from Nazareth. But no, Philip simply said, come and see. As if to say, you don't need me to advertise for Jesus. Come and see for yourself. Nathaniel came and saw for himself. And that becomes our task to tell people, come and see. Come and see what Jesus has done and is doing. Do you notice that all of this is done without pressure or coercion? There's no one threatening the fires of an eternal hell if they don't follow him. Jesus just says, come and see for yourself. Make up your own mind. Follow your own heart. <clears throat> what in the world gets them to pack up their lives and set out after this man? There's no guarantees here. There's no detailed strategic plan for the ministry. There's no promised salary and benefits package. Just come and see. I know you and I want you on my team. Follow me. And they did. 
There's something incredibly powerful about being known. The story is told of a man who was wearing sunglasses, approaching the cash register of a Midwestern pharmacy and telling the employees he was going to rob them. Well, the pharmacist couldn't believe his ears. Stepping forward, the pharmacist thwarted the plans of the would-be burglar and prevented the crime before it came to fruition, but he didn't scare the thief off by pulling out a weapon or a gun of any kind of uh, magnitude. In fact, the pharmacist did not even attempt to dissuade him from the very theft. The man was stopped dead in his tracks. The robber was stopped dead in his tracks because, you see, the pharmacist called out his name. He knew him. <laughs> and recognizing his voice, the pharmacist called him by name and asked if the robbery was a joke. And the man immediately spun around and ran out of the store, boarding a nearby city bus. You see, it's easy to enter into certain situations with a false sense of anonymity, and shielded under the veil of obscurity, the pharmacy break-in seemed somehow easier to carry out, but the man walked into the pharmacy thinking he could just carry out this faceless robbery, when in fact the pharmacist knew his name, knew his address, and enough of his character to suspect it was a joke. Had someone not recognized him, he might have followed through with the crime. Christian story presents the startling thought that God knows our names. Whether living with the suspicion that some flaw, some fear, some thoughts, some worries can stay hidden, how it might change if, if, if you imagine God calling out your name in the very midst of it, would you be startled at the sound of your name? Would be, you be jarred to attention by the only sovereign God in the room? At times, like the pharmacy burglar, we may instinctively feel like running, finding ourselves suddenly exposed where we once thought we were safely hidden. But really, what point is there in running away from someone who already knows your name? Do you remember the prayer of of David is recorded in Psalm 139. David, who we know lived a far from perfect life, David prays, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Where can I go, Lord, from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? And what's most surprising about that prayer is, is when David says something like this, You know me, Lord, inside and out, and it's all too wonderful for me to imagine that I'm known in such a way by you. You get me, Lord. You get me. Sometimes when I don't even understand myself, you get me. And what's even more amazing, you want me on your team, even, even knowing all you know about me. That's a powerful prayer. One of my goals for this place is that all who would come here would feel as if they are known and welcomed as a part of a team, God's team. I hope that the things which have kept us too long feeling as strangers to one another can be overcome. It's not always easy and it takes work. Tomorrow, across this nation, a holiday is recognized in the name of a Baptist preacher, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. His life is the story of one who worked to overcome our feeling as strangers to one another. Perhaps his most well-known remarks came on a hot August afternoon in 1963 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, what has come to be known as the I Have a Dream speech. I have studied that speech, as, as, have, as have many others. It is a rhetorical masterpiece. Not because it has big words in it, or particularly complex theories. There is one phrase in that speech that I think is the reason that people across the world 
have found that speech so captivating. It's when Dr. King says, I have a dream that my four little children will one day 